Well, welcome to CSIS. We're glad to see you all here. I'm Johanna Nesseth. I'm Vice President for Strategic Planning, and I co-direct, along with Dan Rundy here in the front, our project on U.S. leadership and development, looking at private sector-led development and, and really focusing on innovations and development and how companies are engaging uh, through their supply chains, with emerging markets, and through their production in development activities. So I'm Pleased to welcome Janet Boot today with us. We're uh, delighted to have her here. I'll just do a very quick introduction. Um, Janet is Vice President and Global Head of Public Affairs at Nestle. She's located uh, in Europe. And her <coughs> background, uh, since there are a lot of SICE grads, I'll mention that she was a graduate of SICE, featured in the recent SICE sphere, if you didn't see it. <laughs> Happened to read it cover to cover this time because it was on agriculture, which is really interesting. Um, and she has a background in health and nutrition. Uh, she was at, um, sh uh, let's see, let me just confirm. She was at the World Health Organization, um, worked a lot on non communicable diseases, and has taken a lot of this focus with her to Nestle, where she's been for a year and a half. Um, so, nutrition is a strong background, but at Nestle, she's handling all of their broad engagement. Um, with the communities where they work. So Janet, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. What we'll do today, we'll have sort of a Q&A period. Janet and I will talk for a little bit, go through a, a few topics and issues around Nestle's agenda and their operations. And then after a while, we'll open up to questions uh, from the audience. And we are recording this. Um, this will be also posted on our website in case you'd like to look at it at another point. So, just for starters, I'd just like to ask you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you, and then um, tell us about what Nestle's doing, what creating shared value is. I think a lot of this audience understands the concept of creating shared value, but maybe give a quick explanation of what it is and how you got to this point as a core part of Nestle's operations. Okay. Well, thank you for your kind words of introduction. Again, my name is Janet Vogt, and I've had the privilege of um, being with Nestle for the last year and a half. I think it might interest some people in the room to know that I actually joined Nestle because of creating shared value. Um, so these two things are intimately linked. That and Nestle's uh, leadership in nutrition, health, and wellness attracted me to the position that I now have. Um, what I'd like to say about creating shared value, what does it mean at Nestle concretely? Uh, for us, we believe that for a business to be successful over the long term, that it has to not just create value for shareholders, but also value for society. And that those two things have to happen in parallel, concurrently. Um, and I think if, as, you, as you look at uh, the implementation of creating shared value at Nestle, you can look specifically in the areas of nutrition, water, and rural development to see how we have targeted those three areas specifically <laughs> for value creation efforts, specific efforts of Nestle. Um, well, can you talk a little bit about each of those three areas and um, say a few words about sort of what the specific focus is for nutrition, water, and rural development? Well, if you go back to the core supposition about creating shared value, that it creates value for shareholder and value for society, you have to understand society's needs in a mm -hmm. given area. Mm -hmm. So if you think about nutrition, Nestle um, looks at what I will call both ends of the nutrition spectrum. So we look at the double burden of malnutrition. Uh, malnutrition as it is played out in undernutrition, malnutrition as it is played out in overnutrition. And then what we do, even down to in our research facilities, and then down to what we call markets or in countries, we understand the nutrition profile of the populations and the communities that we serve. When we do that, we are able to launch products, for example, popularly positioned products Can that you are micronutrients. What, what yeah. popularly positioned products? It's a mouthful to begin with. Um, another kind of PPP. It's another kind of PPP. It's actually, it, it's an affordable product. It's a product that reaches down, I would argue, perhaps not all the way to the base of the pyramid, but probably to social class C down into D, not all the way to E, if you, if you look at social class structures. And we then fortify these products and make them available and accessible to lower income, low, lower socioeconomic groups. These are provided with, with, with fortification that that population group needs. And we do this in the area of affordable milks. We do this with our Maggie franchise, with, with spice kits, and I could go on forever on, on this. So that's one example of what we do in the area of nutrition. Um, 
in the area of water, we're engaged all the way up and down the spectrum, from being engaged in public policy and collective action, to looking at what we do in our own direct operations, to looking at what we do with supply chain, obviously farmers and the use of water and agriculture, as Bob Thompson knows, um, that's a critical piece of the water use. Uh, so our, I think our water engagement is, is really addressing society's needs and addressing our own business uh, requirements for efficiency. And rural development, again, that's, that's almost a, a perfect example of creating shared value because the more you, for example, in a dairy district model, the more you invest in training your farmers, the better their, their business, their farming business grows and the quality of the product improves. And then Nestle has a secure source of high quality product for our own uh, consumers. So and those are three is, examples. This is very important in, in terms of agriculture because uh, you are at the heart really an agricultural company because you are the world's largest buyer of milk. You, I think, are the world's largest buyer of coffee beans. And fundamentally, you have to have high quality international standards in order to, uh, in order to meet all of your processing needs. So this, this is really core to your business operations, clearly. Um, I want to ask, this is... Um, a little bit of a more technical question, but I want to ask you to talk a little bit about some of the environmental and compliance issues that you deal with. Because you've said you can't have the pyramid if you don't have very strong compliance to laws and regulations, and also uh, very careful adherence to environmental standards. So we're going to go down a little bit of a technical path, but I want you to talk about what that means in terms of compliance and standards and, and why that's so important to what you're doing. Okay. Um, I will, and this is not meant to be advertising, but for those who want to know more about Creating Shared Value, we did just launch this year's Creating Shared Value report, in which you will find a pyramid or a triangle. And that's how we define Creating Shared Value in a holistic fashion at Nestle. And that is to say it starts with compliance, with national laws, codes of conduct, um, and what we call the Nestle Corporate Business Principles. You have to have that firm base of compliance upon which you also build the strongest commitment to the sustainable use of resources to protect future generations. Mm -hmm. And only if those two things are secure can you begin to invest over and beyond that in society's needs as they're associated with your business. So these, it's really part of a whole. Um, I, th I think the compliance issue is one that's come up more and more frequently as we talk with companies about what drives them to uh, manage their supply chains more carefully and effectively, and how they think about their uh, risk and responsibility going forward. So um, it's a very interesting piece. Um, I wanted to talk now a little bit about, you, you've mentioned concept to implementation. Creating shared value is, is a great slogan, and it's a great concept, but how do you actually implement it? How do you ensure that your business managers are measured against some kind of standards how do you evaluate it going forward? And so what, what does that actually look like in a business setting? OK. Um, I think uh, that actually, if you look at the, l let me go back a set step, yeah. if I may, to the birth of the concept. Because the concept, in terms of that terminology, was born in the middle of uh, around 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. In fact, we issued our first Creating Shared Value report in 2006. But we called it Nestle's way of, of corporate social responsibility, and it was a focus on Latin America. But the concept was born out of, this, out of a big debate in Davos about whether business had to give back. Was, is it business's job to give back? Because, and that assumes that business is simply taking out. And it led our chairman to begin to work with Michael Porter and Mark Kramer on, well, wait a minute, go look at our Latin American businesses and tell, tell me, are we just taking out, and therefore all we have to do is give back? Or is there a more fundamental and systematic approach to uh, investing in societal needs? Obviously, the latter was what was discovered. And then since then, the terminology creating shared value was coined towards the end of, the, of around 2007. Now, how do you implement it? At, at Nestle, the way creating shared value is implemented is from the top of the house to the bottom of the house. So uh, again, firm support from the CEO and the chairman. We are, in fact, and at the top of the house, we are advised, the CEO and the chairman are advised by a Creating Shared Value advisory board of experts. One of my experts is here in the room. So we have Professor Bob Thompson, who obviously is a leading light in the area of agriculture and rural development, and he advises Nestle. So that's 
really the top structure. Then there's an implementation structure. We have a creating shared value alignment board where operations sit together with, with research, sit together um, with the CEO and, and the marketing people so that it, you bring together the functions. And then at a market level, at a country level, the businesses have to have a creating shared value element into their business plan. So that's as far as we've gotten okay. to date. But there's a lot more work to do. <laughs> There's still a lot more work to do in its measurement and making it systematic. So you actually set specific numerical targets, reduce use of water by X, you know, increase participation in rural farming by Y. I think what, what those of you who are, who are interested in, we've just published our online report mm -hmm. on creating shared value. And for better or for worse, it's 200 pages long. So yes, we report. <laughs> Um, and we track key performance indicators. So exactly, certainly in the sustainability arena, uh, use of resources, greenhouse gases, water use, water use per ton, packaging, et cetera. Um, we track our performance in the area back to compliance on, on human rights and, and how many human rights assessments we've undergone. And then in the areas of nutrition, water, and rural development, we are to the point where we can track, for example, how many products have we removed fat, sugar, or salt from. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've got some indicators, but there's still a future in creating shared value that we haven't right. reached. Right. Yeah, and, and, and I suppose looking at how that actually impacts society is more steps down the path. So I'm, I'm sure you're working on that next. Um, but that's a lot of progress in six or seven years. Um, tell me, do you, you all talk a lot about um, why creating shared value is so important for Nestle's future, but can you talk a little bit about the business case as you see it? Is there particular risk you're worried about? Um, if, if this was sort of a reaction to, well, we're not giving back enough, what does that mean? Are you looking at these are future markets? Are you looking at we want um, socially minded investors to want to invest in us? What are the drivers for your business as you think about it? I mean, I. I assume that you've got to really take care to have high quality supplies for your ag products. That's probably an important piece. You've got growing markets that you're trying to reach. But tell me a little bit more about this, this, these driving demands that you see you're meeting through this approach. I think it's, it's, it's really very fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the uh, Nestle is an amazing corporation with 330,000 employees and, and over a billion products sold per day. They managed to put their corporate business strategy. We managed to put our corporate business strategy on one page, which I think is fairly impressive. And creating shared value is, is right at the middle of it. Um, but I think, I think you, make it, you make it real. Um, you make it real. You make it uh, tangible for people by you know, sharing it with your employees, by embedding it in how they think. Um, and I, th I believe that it addresses, so it's not, it, it's not a side event, is what I'm trying to say. But more importantly, what risks is it addressing? Uh, in the nutrition arena, there are real societal risks. And these aren't just business risks. These are societal risks and business risks. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? If society, if we face this double burden of malnutrition, we face it. As a company, we face it as a society. Those are not two different, two different things. If you have the growing problem of overweight and obesity, you have increasing, you know, 1.5 million billion, sorry, people who are overweight in the world. You have increasing rates of disease. That's bad for society. Society cannot afford that kind of burden, and nutrition has a role to play. So there's a very fundamental societal need. Same thing on the undernutrition, malnutrition side of the equation. So there's a societal need, and a and a and a business potential can help. It's not the full solution. Same thing, worse in water. I mean, if you, if you follow at all some of the, the develops in the water arena, I mean, water, uh, if you look at, at water-stressed areas, there's high concern about excessive withdrawal and not enough natural renewal. I mean, that's a risk to society. That's a risk to business. And then on rural development, if you look at any of the data on poverty, you'll see that 70% of, of uh, of global poverty can be attributed to rural areas. Well, that's a social risk and it's a business risk. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to separate the two. Well, that, that's a very interesting response, that they're intertwined they in, are. in every case. 
And I want to I want to dive into each of these areas a little bit more. We'll maybe end on nutrition because there's lots to talk about there. Um, but let's start with water. So you have um, you've had to take some efforts to reduce the amount of water, to reduce the amount of packaging. Can you just describe some of the efforts you've taken, both in in practical terms for your business operations, but then in policy terms, because you've been very active at Nestle in the policy debate around water. If you could just describe that. Certainly. Well, I think um, if we look at Nestle's efforts in water, you really have to look at the effort of our chairman, Peter Brabeck, who, who early on recognized uh, the problem of water stressed areas. It's, it's, a, it's a political problem. It's a, it's a health problem. It's a, an agricultural problem. It's a fundamental problem. And so he recognized this early on and went to work with the World Economic Forum, now obviously over at the IFC, on, and created, helped create the Water Resources Group. And this Water Resources Group does work to help engage uh, government leaders really at a state level, because this isn't often countrywide. It's, it's region. It's very specific. So engage in the public policy, and not just the public policy debate, but get ministers engaged in problem solving. Because only if you have the government involved can you start to change agricultural practices, can you start to change uh, production practices, uh, can you make the kind of laws and regulations and agreements that it takes to change what's going on in a region. So that's on the public policy side. Then obviously, uh, returning clean water to the environment is our responsibility. So we've continuously invested in water treatment plants to make sure that the water that comes from our factories is clean going back out. Um, additionally, we work with our farmers to help them uh, reduce the use of water in their own agricultural supply chain. And obviously, that helps them uh, make a better wage, make a better living by using less water um, in their production. So we really are active in many, many ways, from public policy collective action in our direct operations with our agricultural, within our agricultural supply chain and water. Great. And of course, World Water Day is Thursday. And we had a discussion on water and food security earlier this morning. And, and, and water and agriculture, water and food are so intertwined and so impossible to link that you have to manage both of them in, in tandem. Um, moving to rural development, you mentioned earlier that you have 17,000 agriculture extension, extension workers. workers. You have 17,000 people who are on the ground teaching farmers how to grow cocoa, how to have better uh, practices, how to, um, how to grow higher quality, higher quantities of food so that you have better supplies. So, um, and I will mention that I think a lot of the discussion in Washington tends to focus on growing crops, but you have a lot of dairy producers you're also trying to work with. So I want to ask you to talk through some of your rural development approaches, um, both on the crop side and then on the, the dairy production side. How are you working with farmers to uh, help them to improve their quality so they're better suppliers, but also improve their lives? OK. Well, I think um, if, if my agricultural colleagues were here and my, um, and my uh, supply chain colleagues, they would talk about the 12 key um, commodities that, mm -hmm. that Nestle buys. But let me just. Uh, focus in on, on three areas. Sure. Uh, in the area of, of cocoa, for example, we're very much focused on, uh, in this case, I'll talk about West Africa, uh, Ivory Coast. And we have a very integrated approach to what we're doing in cocoa. So we have a research center in Abidjan, and the Abidjan, the Abidjan Research Center is focused on supplying very high quality um, and disease resistant plantlets to the farmers. So helping them to have better plants, to have better yields from the plants. But we are engaged up and down uh, the chain with these farmers. Additionally, we're investing in schools. We're investing in water and sanitation for the schools so that they can have healthier communities. So it's a, it's a very integrated approach, if you would, what we're doing in cocoa. It's strengthening the community, strengthening the farm, farming practices. Um, we also are active in mazes and legumes. We have training programs going on in, in, in northern Ghana, I can illustrate, where we work on just making sure that the quality remains high, not just what is grown, but right. how it's stored. Right. Right. And then, of course, we're very active in uh, dairy farming um, and have a milk district model, which is, sends veterinarians into the field mm -hmm. um, and does all kinds of, of training and assistance to the farmers to make sure that their business grows, in fact. Not that all of you care about this, but on the dairy side of things, um, if you look at the difference in production between US, oh yeah, Molly's the dairy person, wherever she is. <laughs> US dairy production is double or triple that of most places, most developing countries. It's, it's enorm US dairy is enormously productive and trying to raise productivity. There are all kinds of ways to raise dairy production, as Bob well knows. Um, and so training 
and processes are really essential to that. So I can see that that's got to be a core part of how you operate. Um, I, I, it does make me wonder, though, since you mentioned that you do have schools and you do a lot of types of outreach, where do you draw the line? How do you decide th this is where we stop, that's not core to what we're doing, even if it would be good for this community where we're working? I'm afraid I love that question. If you want to know the discussions that are going on right now with Michael Porter and Mark Kramer and at the UN Global Compact, where do you draw the line? Well, and then the question is, does it really matter? But we spend discussions saying, okay, well, this is creating shared value, but that, now, now, now you're into CSR and now, now you're in philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So you do have to <laughs> begin to say clearly when you're close to the business, you're creating shared value. So what you're doing with the farmer, mm -hmm. um, you're training him that, you know, helps the farmer have a higher living standard, helps Nestle have a better business. And then we go beyond that, and we go into the communities to make sure they have healthy communities. And we run Nestle Healthy Kids programs in, in the communities to treat, teach nutrition education. And we supply um, you know, clean drinking water because you need a healthy community. Where does creating shared value end? Where does another concept begin? In the end, we decided it doesn't really matter. It's What's really important is you're investing in the community and you're strengthening that community and in so doing you're actually indirectly uh, benefiting your business. But as we go forward in measuring creating shared value, we're likely to stick more closely mm -hmm. to the business. At least that you can imagine uh, getting the measurement and metrics right. Um, it, it makes me wonder sort of one step further. Uh, in the US, we're talking a lot about demand-driven development. Communities define or countries define what they need. To what extent does that, do communities say to you, we need this kind of help in order to be a community that's a good host to your operations? And to what extent do you say, this is what we need in order to meet our business goals? Or is it a constant give and take? I think it's a constant give and take. And, and in fact, that, that give and take is something we're trying to train and teach. Okay. Let me give you an example. We, you know, we set up a new factory. We're gonna, if we set up a new factory in Angola, we're realizing that knowing your community is a really important thing. Um, and maybe 50 years ago, we were still doing it, but it wasn't, made, it wasn't done explicitly. Now, knowing your community is really very important. You have to know the people that are in the area. You have to know um, their health situation, their education situation. So you'll see when we, put up a, when we have a factory in a rural area, you end up providing traineeship and literacy training and, and all kinds of support based on what they need. Mm -hmm. um, but, but this is something that becomes ever more important going forward, is knowing your community, knowing your stakeholders, knowing your community. Well, when your chairman was here a couple of weeks ago, he made, he, he made a comment about the real change over the past 20 years that globalization has brought to a company, that it used to be that you would have to uh, produce uh, process and market where you were selling. And, and globalization has completely changed this. So the shift in all of these areas clearly is, is going to happen for some time. Um, and and I, I wanted to ask, since you mentioned it, can you talk about this continuum of creating shared value to CSR to philanthropy? Because it's something that we kind of toss around a lot, but I don't know if it's well understood. What, what is that continuum? And, what counts as each, in your opinion? Well, well I, in fact, we're actively working together with the UN Global Compact on, on a paper, that, a white paper that they'll be putting out. And they draw a spectrum, which is on one end they have core business, on the other end they have philanthropy. And they've conveniently put creating shared value right in the middle, which I think is probably a, a good place because it, it does match the two, the business and societal needs. What we, would, what we would say is there's a place for all of the above. And it really depends on the company, it depends on the company's business, and it depends, you know, some, some companies have big uh, philanthropic foundations, and they do a, a lot of good with a philanthropic foundation. Uh, CSR was probably at the origin, some of our colleagues in the, who were focused on sustainability um, really came from the CSR world. So th these, this is evolution, not revolution. I think the interesting thing about creating shared value is that we believe, again, it, by its intimate links with the business, it is long-term and sustainable. That is perhaps, and because it is close to the business, it would not change with the change of management, if you mm -hmm. see what I mean. So that's one of its. Oh, so that's an important point. So you feel that this is a permanent part of your operations. It won't change with management. It's, it's, it's there to stay. That's, that's an interesting point. And if you think about nutrition, water, and rural development. They're not going to change. They're business. not going to change. Yeah. Well, let's talk about nutrition um, a bit, because I know you have a real passion for it. And um, we have 
we just have a massive, massive problem in the world in terms of nutrition. Uh, we have people who are malnourished and undernourished where eating more meat in the diet and more vegetables and more calories is totally important. Whereas we have a lot of obesity and we absolutely do not know how to change people's behaviors so that they eat less or they eat differently. I, I always argue that it's just as inexpensive to buy a some cheap bag of lentils and and a can of spinach to make a very nutritious meal, but nobody wants to eat it because it doesn't taste very good. Um, and how you, how you get people to change cultural and personal habits on a household and personal level three to four times a day is an enormous task. And the food industry is going to have to deal with this either <coughs> through regulation or through choice. And so I think it's sort of one of the big questions we face over the next decade. And I know that you have strong feelings about this too. So I wanted to ask uh, you to just talk about your efforts in nutrition and, and tell us what you think about this trend and what's, what's going to shape it up over the next five to 10 years. And that's a lot of big questions. So you can yeah. start off by just telling us what Nestle's doing on nutrition and okay. with some of your, um, your um, micronutrient additions and spice packets and fortification, and then we can go to the other questions. Okay. Um, well, I'll, then I'll go to the, I'll just tell, tell you a little bit more about the micronutrient fortification uh, and a little bit more about the, as we call the PPP, the other yeah. PPP. Um, one of the most exciting um, pieces of work that we're doing is around the Maggi Cube and making a spice pack uh, be a bearer of, of micronutrients. It's like a bouillon cube, right? Yeah, well, we have it on bouillon cubes. Okay. We've just recently launched a Nigeria bouillon cube that's not only iodized, but it has iron. There's a lot of iron deficiency in, 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 uh, in Nigeria. And we actually, one of the benefits, we work with a partner, and, and one of the benefits is that we can do the consumer advertising. And, and partners on the ground can then do the social, can work with the government to sensitize society to the need for these kinds mm -hmm. of, for, for this kind of fortification. So it's very much in partnership. Same in India with the, with the spice packs that we're distributing together with, a, with an NGO called Drishti, and we can reach into these populations with, with, with products that are appropriate to their need. Um, so I think that's, that's the beginning of an effort where the food industry can contribute. The food industry, I mean, we at Nestle, we can, we can do our part. We can't solve the problem. We can probably stave off the problem. It, it will take the efforts of many, which is why I think whether you're talking about undernutrition or overnutrition, I, I, the only way I can see forward is if we have cooperation across you know, private and public, so governments, NGOs, and the private sector. I don't see any other solution. Um, to addressing some of the challenges. If you look at the non-communicable disease agenda, what is the role of the food industry? What are some of the things that the food industry has stepped up and, and Nestle right there at the forefront of it? There are efforts being made in product reformulation, the reduction of fat, sugar, and salt in products. It's essential. You want them to still taste good, but you have to make them ever you know, healthier. And Nestle's been on this journey since early 2000, it's, and slowly but surely reducing some new, um, fat, sugar, and salt. We have to do better labeling. We have to practice the fine art of responsible marketing, and particularly uh, with regards to children. Um, and we have to promote healthy lifestyles and work in partnership. And I think we have to go beyond the things you're not supposed to do and also engage in creative partnerships where you're promoting healthy lifestyles. Because behavior change is not an easy thing. That's right. And, and a behavior change is not an easy thing. And what you don't want to have happen is for the food industry to take so much salt out that the American consumer is simply going to the retailer to buy more salt. That's not changing the behavior. So behavior change is complex. Um, we're privileged to work both with Nestle Healthy Kids. We work in partnership with nutrition experts around the world to increase the level of nutrition, education, and understanding among young people. We've been part of EPOD, which is a originally a, a French program to prevent childhood obesity. It's a community-based initiative that has shown real results. So we're trying to work it at a community level with experts and learn by doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of evolution to take place in this space, <coughs> clearly. Um, well, let me just ask if there, before we turn it over to um, all of you to ask questions, are there any other areas that I have missed that you'd like to highlight or any stories or examples from your travels and your experiences you'd like to share? No, I, I think I would go back to the work of, of I, I think what's exciting to watch is some of the work of Michael Porter and Mark Kramer. To, uh, we're working with FSG right now on the area of measurement and metrics. I think one of the great challenges is as we try to meet the needs of, of responsible, the responsible investment community, the social investors, 
uh, we're developing more and more and more and more KPIs, um, yes. key performance indicators, sorry, key performance indicators. One of the challenges is as you try to report everything, um, that enables everyone who's looking at you in a different, uh, on a different light to have some information. One of the challenges will be, though, how do you actually prove the investment case around creating shared value? And that's, I think, where it's going next. How do you prove that a, an investment X delivered business result Y and social result Z? We know how to do this part, but how do you measure social outcomes? And I think that will take partnership efforts and the knowledge of many. And is this a very costly effort for you, or is it so integral to your business that the costs are not quite Well, in as fact, no, I, I would not be able to turn to you and say, today we spend X on creating shared value. It's too much part, it's of, the part of the business. It's part of the business. So you couldn't even tease it out. Interesting. All right. Well, that I want to ask Dan Rundy, I think, is uh, Dan is the co director of our project on development here. I think he would like to probably make a couple of comments if we could get the microphone up front. And then we'll uh, open up. Oh, Dan, you spilled your Diet Coke. <laughs> it's not leaking. It's not leaking. Yeah, thank you. Well, I do want to congratulate Nestle on, uh, on all that you've done. I think it's uh, really, you're one of the real leaders on development. And I think uh, the way that you are a change agent in rural development in a way that others, I think, don't realize in the sense that you touch so many smallholder farmers around the world. But I th what I wanted to push on a little bit more was this issue of collective action, that, that many of the challenges that we face, even for a company as large as Nestle, has to, has to find ways to work across an ind various indu your, your industry competitors as well as with governments. Could you talk a little bit more about how, how you think about working with your competitors on a specific public good or collective action issue? How do you make that decision? And then also how you think about partnering with, with governments, whether it's local governments or, or donor governments or the UN system? Um, I, I, always, I always love the statement, the, the, the pre-competitive concept. And I know that the terms pre-competitive are really readily used in the development community and sometimes in the corporate world it's like, mm, okay, what is pre-competitive is what, what is not. But where I think we're really getting that right is in the water arena. And if you look at the water resources group, it's made up of many, many corporate leaders together with business leaders, together with members of the development community. I think if the, the need is great enough, the realization becomes that we can only do this together. So. I'm quite impressed about the progress we see um, in terms of multi-company um, uh, and the development community working together, certainly in the water arena. Um, in, in all of these areas, though, it takes partnership with other players. In rural development, you'll see us working with development aid agencies. You'll see us working with NGOs. Uh, we work on training of female dairy farmers. We work with different UN agencies or, or, or development aid agencies. So I think addressing a social problem almost always requires not just the business, because the business can only go a certain distance. It, it's, it's again, we don't go the full distance. It, it will take the government, it will take the UN agency, it will take the NGO to deliver part of, of, of that program or that to achieve the social outcome that you desire. So it's definitely, I mean, if, if we look at the topic we discuss when Nestle holds an annual Creating Shared Value Forum, it's always the changing role of business and society, you know, and, 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 and the changing role of business in development. And so that means business has a role that's increasingly being recognized, but it's not a role by, in and of itself at all. Great. Well, let's open up to questions. I think I'll bundle two or three at a time uh, right in the front. And then we'll go to a couple more, and then we'll let Janet respond to a couple at a time. If you could just state your name and affiliation. Sure. Hello. Uh, Margaret Ziegler, Congressional Hunger Center. Thank you very much. Um, I am thinking about these three sectors that you've mentioned today, water, uh, rural development, and agriculture. And really, which I just thought the, the kind of uh, connecting force of all those is the, the gender issue because women are so responsible for the nutrition of their children, the care and feeding practices. Women are oftentimes more heavily represented in rural areas, um, and definitely in agriculture, the production of at least household food is, is very much the responsibility of, of the, the woman farmer in the developing world. So I'm wondering if you can explain or, or talk a little bit more if there are 
gender specific outreach, a gender, a cross cutting gender policy that you might have at Nestle um, that really provides extra oomph <laughs> to, to get the job done in these areas. Okay, uh, right in the front, and then they'll take these two right in the front. Hi, Kimberly Reed, International Food Information Council Foundation. Uh, Janet, you're a great uh, representative of uh, everything that we care about in the world as far as approaching um, a behavior. And so our organization did a roundtable recently with USDA and HHS looking at consumer behaviors. We address NCDs and obesity. But I would love to get your uh, global viewpoint on that since Nestle is a global um, company and uh, what, what else is happening around the world on uh, examining behavior. Okay. And then next to you. Camille Saade from FHI 360. Um, I look at Nestle and I'm envious uh, because when I go to a country like uh, Senegal in Dakar, I see the kiosk uh, on the street selling Nescafe. And I say, why can't we do this for oral rehydration salts or for mosquito bed nets or for, for any other commodity uh, that is uh, needed for public health? However, I don't dare talking with my colleagues about collaborating with Nestle. You know why. My nutritious colleague, my nutrition colleagues are very vociferous. And when I talk about public-private partnership with a, with a company like Nestle, ah, I'm the en I become the enemy. Do they like me, usually? So help me change the image of Nestle that has stuck for two and a half decades in the mind of my nutrition colleagues. And when they think about Nestle, they think about the enemy, and that prevents other departments, other centers in my organization from collaborating far or close with your organization. Okay, so gender. And I oh. have an idea. Oh, good. I'll tell you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so gender behavior change, and then um, the question of sort of the lingering infant formula question, I think, is what you're asking. And I think you have addressed all of these, so. I'll, I'll take them in order, and I, I'm looking forward to the third one. Um, <laughs> Um, on, on the gender issue, it's actually something very exciting that we do focus on within Nestle. Obviously, we've taken an interesting approach both internally on gender. What we've done is, unlike what many companies have done, we don't just train the women, we actually train the men. Um, so we're really looking at the gender issue over a long time and try to bu build female leadership for future generations at Nestle because indeed females are the women are the consumers and women have to be the leadership, uh, part of the leadership team going forward. So we've do, done a great deal in the area of uh, sensitivity training uh, of men and women around gender issues. Um, externally, some of the uh, things that we do, I guess the area that I find the most exciting is some female employment models, which, uh, for example, if you look in the favelas today, we have uh, a group of women, we call this program Atavoche. We started, I believe, less than four or five years ago. And today we have 10,000 female saleswomen in selling Nestle products from yogurts to, to confectionery products in the favelas. And they earn a very seriously much better earning than they, uh, you know, living wage than they would have had previously. You're seeing the same thing with Maggie ladies. Uh, one of my colleagues quoted the number of 85,000 Maggie saleswomen in Nigeria. How do they so, sell? Do they have uh, carts and carts and, carts and, and so I think economic employment uh, gives economic you know employment opportunities gives e economic uh, empowerment. Uh, additionally, certainly in the training area, again the female dairy farmers. So we are and and literacy training. I think we're doing that in in Morocco and several other uh, several other countries. So. Um, we're getting there, and I think there's some examples of, that are really very, very positive that we build on and, and share within the company. Um, regarding Kimberly's question on consumer behaviors, I don't think anyone has solved it yet. I know that Nestle is looking very hard internally, in addition to what we do already, so product reformulation and better labeling. How can we help consumers? Because we have such a broad basket of products to offer for us, 
helping consumers, I mean, in addition to Jenny Craig, and in addition to providing skinny cow ice cream, which I personally think is really great and wish we had in Europe, um, <laughs> Uh, how does a food company help work with others on these community-based programs to change behaviors uh, in communities? And the, the best knowledge that we have, the best science, I think, around this is that it takes many players. It'll take the school system, it'll take the media, it'll take the companies, it will take really a surround sound approach to begin to change consumer behaviors. So it's not an easy one. But we wrestle with it and we look at what, what more we can do. How much more information, how can we help our consumers? on the historical issue on infant formula that uh, still is very much associated in people's minds uh, when they think of Nestle. I think there are a lot of uh, recent developments that I'd like to share. One is it's important to know that Nestle fully supports WHO recommendation for six months exclusive breastfeeding. Okay? Our scientists say the same thing as the WHO scientists. And we're making sure that that message is more visible on websites in materials that we share with doctors in any conferences that we held, hold. So it's not just a little small line at the bottom of a product. It's really uh, becoming ever more systematic. In terms of how do we ever shake the legacy, I think the only way this will be done is through external parties. What we have done recently is uh, Nestle is very privileged to have been reviewed by a responsible investment index. It's called FTSE for Good. It's owned now by the London Stock Exchange. And FTSE for Good has looked at Nestle in the area of supply chain, in the area of human rights, and in the area of responsible marketing of breast milk substitutes. They have a series of experts on this breast milk substitute uh, committee who have looked at Nestle's policies and practices. And they have specifically focused on 152 high risk countries. Those countries with high risk of child mortality, uh, malnutrition. And so we've started by focusing there and not marketing any infant formula products from zero to 12 months for the children. That's been reviewed and Nestle is the only infant formula manufacturer included in this <coughs> index. That is, I'm not to say that Nestle is perfect. You know, we're not perfect, but we are really trying a to have external verification take place so that we invite in auditors and they audit our practices from places like India and Zambia and they don't tell us in advance we get a three week morning so you so um, you just to make sure that the management team is there and this process of verification is ongoing and we're speaking to more and more stakeholders asking them to please send any compliance issues that they have and send them directly and send them now and don't wait for three years to publish a report where nobody can find where the problem was. So I'm hopeful that there's, with more direct stakeholder engagement, um, at least there'll be a better dialogue and better cooperation. I think it's in society's interests that, that the nutrition community come together and not practice the fine art of blacklisting. And in so doing, maybe we can work on oral rehydration um, products and we work, can work on issues of zinc that we today have not, up until now, have not been able to do. Great, okay, next round, uh, right here in the back. Hi, my name is Maggie Clausia. I'm with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Um, I was just wondering if you could, I find the whole concept of creating shared value to be very compelling, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you make that idea compelling to your shareholders, and how you really demonstrate to them that it makes business and financial sense and how, in turn, you might recommend other businesses consider this as the model of the future. Okay, um, okay woman in the orange jacket and man in the purple jacket, purple shirt, because we're getting close to spring. Take a <laughs> colorful group today. I'm so glad I chose this jacket. <laughs> um, I'm Vicki Gao from Department of Commerce, and my question is, um, is more to the, to the definition of shared value. I'd like you to drill down a little bit more, um, if possible. Um, in terms of how, I mean, where, um, for example, what's the difference between shared value and, ha and entering in like a symbiotic relationship with the community? Um, in other words, you know, and not in a bad way, but um, in other words, when you go into community, a lot of times we know that a steadying force, a steadying, you know, anchor can really bring a community alive. But at the same time, you know, a lot of, there, there could be a chance where everybody becomes so dependent on one single force that if that force leaves, then what you've built, you know, disappears. 
So I'm just wondering if Nestle goes into the community, you know, thinking that, you know, eventually they're gonna, you know, create something and then leave, it, you know, making sure that, that that's something will survive after they leave, or do you go in there willing to stay and, you know, and and um, kind of a longevity point of view? Okay, all right, and then if you want to pass the microphone over. Dan Silverstein, Heuristic Management. Do you correlate uh, the underwriting to gross sales, or is there some other business metric that you use that relates funding for creating shared value to your income statement? Okay. All right. We'll stop there and let you respond to those. We're, we're zeroing in on the metrics and measurement issue, and I think you may have to uh, read the white paper that's coming out shortly. But um, in terms of shareholders, I think that was an interesting question. How do we convince them? Well, th this is something that happens slowly. Um, first, first and foremost, when we report on creating shared value, we report it together with our annual report and our financials. These things, these reports are bundled. They are sent to all of the shareholders. Are there some who would describe themselves personally as social investors uh, more than traditional investors? Certainly. Um, but the, the reporting is done uh, in one bundled package to the shareholders. Creating shared value obviously is discussed at the annual shareholder meeting. So the, um, the, the subject of, of, of the financials and, and what we're doing in creating shared value is reported together. Uh, how do we convince them? I think we convince them, again, by being a long-term su successful company um, and having long-term successful business results. Uh, which we've been fortunate to uh, continuously deliver for quite a long period of time um, consistently over the last, I believe, 16 years and more. Uh, Do you think that any of this is related to being a European company versus an American company, or is it completely, is that completely irrelevant? The only, uh, you know, we're, we are a European company, so it's hard for us to speak for others. The only thing, question I've had people ask is, is again, we don't, uh, we don't face the same pressures about the reporting of quarterly earnings. So that may have an impact on one's ability to take a long-term view. Uh, in that sense, perhaps there is a difference. Uh, but I hope it's not one that is, prevents the long-term view and creating shared value, certainly, certainly here in the States. Regarding the, the business metrics and the income statement, this is something we're not yet to integrated reporting. And we're not yet to the point where I can answer the question, we invested X to deliver this financial result and this social result. We're not there yet. I think that is something the reporting uh, around creating shared value is something that's going to evolve rapidly over time. Currently we're working with a number of other companies. Um, in fact, uh, other companies together uh, with the consulting firm FSG to look at how different companies measure creating shared value. So this is, uh, we're learning by doing and I think that we'll progress year on year. But there's not a quick answer today. I can't, I can't turn to you and say, this is the impact on the bottom line. We believe it fundamentally that it's part of our successful long-term business model, but I can't prove it to you today. Um, and then in terms of the, uh, the shared value definition and drilling down to how long, you know, how will it survive and, and do we stay in the community? I guess the only thing I can say, and this is anecdotal evidence, but Nestle just celebrated 100 years in the Philippines, and we're celebrating 100 years in India. And I'm not sure maybe some of my colleagues would know how many other countries we've celebrated 100 years in. This one? Yeah. OK. So, so um, we invest for the long term. Uh, and I think that's why creating shared value is so uh, intuitively comfortable for, for Nestle's management team. Uh, this isn't, and, and I think what makes it survive over the long term is it's, it's nutrition. We're a leading nutrition, health, and wellness company. That's not going to change. And it's water and it's agriculture, and those are intimately linked to our core business. So this is not a quick project that you, you go in and out of. So I think it is long term and sustainable. Well, let's take another round. Uh, right in the middle here, and then we'll move back over here. And we'll get to you next. Thank you. I'm Aileen Gelbard. I direct a project called Company Community Partnerships for Healthy and Sustainable Communities. And we've been working for four years in Indonesia. And Nestle is a member of our roundtable, which is a members-only organization that now has 130 
organizations, uh, over 50 companies and over 60 NGOs. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of information and then ask you a question about partnerships elsewhere. Uh, you talked about dairy farmers, and, and uh, when we received this invitation, two days later we received the draft of a case study of a partnership that you have with a, an organization called EVOS, which is a Dutch organization operating in Indonesia for uh, transferring um, animal waste into biogas for household energy. And Le Nestle's role in the partnership is to provide zero cost loans to co farmers' cooperatives for about two, th I'm trying to remember all the details because it's very fresh and we're still working on it, but pr to provide two thirds of the costs of the biogas uh, units, which then help in particular women and children to be healthier in rural areas. And uh, so it's improving the quality of lives and the farmers then who get the loans from the cooperatives pay back the loan in milk production. So they don't get fully paid. But so I thought you might like to know that if you didn't, then we'll be happy to provide you with the case study when it's finished. And I just wanted to mention that this is the way we've been able to overcome some of the mistrust that you were talking about because we have organizations that come together and they sit in the same room. We've been able to get them to the same table, companies and NGOs, and keep them at the same table because they all sign guidelines about that really involve listening to each other and not yelling at each other, and it's proving to be uh, very effective. It, it was an experiment, and we're very excited that it's, it's progressing so well. Group therapy, then, <laughs> uh, as Dan keeps saying. All right, let's move to the back, uh, the woman in the white jacket. Thank you. I'm Michelle Rivard with the U.S. African Development Foundation. We are an independent government agency working in a lot of the African countries where Nestle is. And from your report last year, you have a, a big lofty goal of by, in a couple years from now, that 80% of what you source, milk, tea, and coffee, is going to come from smallholder farmers. So I'd like to know how that is progressing. Great. Um, and then there's one other hand up right here in the front. We'll take that and then turn back. And then we'll get to you in the next round. Hi, Natalie Vapel with the World Food Program. Yeah. Um, hi, Janet. Nice hey, to Natalie. Again. Um, not to belabor the issue of um, metrics measurements, but I do think it's, um, it's very interesting that you're taking that quite seriously. And going back to how you were um, describing um, uh, shared value and how do you determine where it's you know, close to the core business, is it are we still talking about shared value? Are we moving to CSR? Are we moving to philanthropy? When you're doing these metrics, um, have you thought about or are you already measuring in such a way, way to where you can look at the impact on the business when you're investing right directly with, uh, at, the, um, at your core business, so working with farmers, organizations, and then perhaps you're, you measure the impact in a community where you're also investing in the schools, supporting the schools or supporting the community in a different way compared to where you would only help the farmers. And perhaps you'd have some quantitative information that could be helpful for also other, co other companies who would um, who'd be interested in doing the same kind of model. Okay. Well, that's, that's a big question. Well, I'm happy one isn't a question. Actually, it was an excellent example from yeah. Indonesia. And I'm really, really grateful for that one. Um, in terms of uh, to the lady who asked about um, our progress in Africa, I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, so I can't, I can't possibly tell you. I know it's part of our Farmer Direct pro program. I know that we're working very hard on working directly with the farmers and increasing those numbers. I know we work on increase, you know, great stories, and they're not just anecdotal stories of changing the sources of, source of blue onions from Germany for our Nigerian-produced Maggie Cubes to, to um, the region. So uh, this is something that we're doing, but I'd be happy to get back to you with, with better numbers. We have numbers that are aggregate, but not for, for Africa specifically. I know um, this is a priority. And we and know that we talked about the total number worldwide of small farmers is 600 to 650,000. 600,000, 600,000. Yeah. So a, a lot we of farmers working. you're working directly to source from. Absolutely. Um, and in terms of the measurement metrics, it's very interesting. In the rural development area and in the farmers, clearly there are certain metrics that are, that are accessible. So you can count the number of farmers with whom you deal. You can count, uh, if it's a dairy farmer, how many cows. And you can count that over time. You can, uh, it's, it's, it's perhaps 
more doable than some of the more challenging areas are in the nutrition field. Um, how do you calculate, how do you know the nutrition status of a community before you go in and the nutrition status of a community after a certain period of time when you've been selling certain products? What we're, what we're experimenting with is in those cases when you're doing, looking at nutrition outcomes is, uh, is to do that in partnership. With, with experts, so that you have the scientific expertise, you'll have somebody who does the baseline survey and, 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 and does um, an outcomes uh, assessment. That's something that's, that's more difficult to do without doing it in partnership. But I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, um, what, what would be the difference on the impact on the business? For instance, can you prove perhaps that the yields um, have improved or, or the quantity of, um, of, yeah, the yields or the quality of the yields have improved? Um, um, based on the fact that maybe the, the farmers now um, are, are able to um, eat, eat better food because of the support you're giving their communities or not worry about the, the health of their children. In other words, all of the collateral that you're giving is actually having an impact on your business. It's sort of providing more um, reasons to get companies to, to also, do this. Yes. I, I do think we have sufficient data to make that case. I think we have very clearly sufficient data to make that case. Particularly, you know, you can you can go down to a region. We, we, we've done an assessment, I think, that'll, that will be able to uh, make available on the MOGA Dairy District, which really takes this example down to the bottom. Not only, you know, what's happened to the dairy farmer, what's happened to the community, what's happened to the provision of of clean water, what's happened to the social indicators, and we know what's happened to our business, and it's been a good thing. Um, so I, I think we will, uh, I don't think we can answer it just all over the world, every single piece of data that you'd like to have, but certainly there are examples within our system which prove the, the business case for this kind of investment in rural development. And that the fact, and we know, we know on the quality. I mean, our experts know definitely that there's an improvement quality. I don't know if my colleague Bob Thompson wants to add anything on the rural development uh, efforts of, of Nestle. Can you get the microphone? <coughs> Since he advises us and is certainly a greater expert. Um, no, I can think you just the. Introduce yourself, Bob. Uh, Bob Thompson. I'm visiting uh, at uh, SICE for a couple of years right now, retired from University of Illinois. Um, I think the one thing I would add about rural development is that uh, when you're dealing with uh, smallholders, that in many cases where that it's impossible for them to get more land, uh, they need opportunities for non-farm employment. And I've been impressed with Nestle's first build, it, making multi-million dollar investments in rural areas, training local people to perform the jobs or to, to be to have the skills to be hired uh, by Nestle for working in the plant uh, to catalyze uh, allied businesses like suppliers of packaging, suppliers of trans transportation services within that rural area. Uh, and I sense there's a very significant multiplier effect uh, uh, in terms of non-farm employment creation and economic activity creation uh, in, those, in those local areas. Uh, but uh, one example I found when I was working on last year's uh, Creating Shared Value report, uh, when Nestle built its powdered milk plant in Pakistan, it was the largest powdered milk plant in the world. And it was built in a rural area entirely supplied by smallholders. Uh, and uh, that's, that really impressed me, that the, the commitment they had. And so I think this is uh, the one thing I would add uh, related to rural development that... Uh, I, I've been impressed with it in the last two years during my service on the advisory board. Let me ask you um, sort of a separate question on your Maggie cubes and spice packets. So these must be very inexpensive spice packets, a couple cents a piece or something. Do you get pressure to provide those free of charge or to just donate those? Or do you always go in saying, this is, this is part of our product line, this is what we sell, it's sort of a, uh, an opener for our products? at a very, very low cost to move consumers up the ladder. How do you react to pressures like that? Well, I think there's a growing realization in the development community that you can go for a giveaway model, but it won't be sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're really looking for is an affordable model. It, and it, it is our responsibility to get the uh, cost structure down to a point where the product is 
affordable. And, and then to work with partners to make it um, accessible because we might not have the reach all the way into the areas. So actually, I would argue there's less of that pressure today than there was perhaps 10 or 20 years ago when people believed that a donation model was the solution. Yes, I, I'm talking about for, for long-term sustainable uh, development. Clearly, donations are relevant in disaster and emergency. Mm -hmm. That remains the case. That shall always remain the case. But it, for long-term systematic development, you actually need a business model that sticks. We had a conversation a while ago, about a year and a half ago, and Coca-Cola was involved. And they talked about the importance of sort of fortification, of not just creating something that's fortified and putting it out. Because if people don't know what they're buying, or if they don't know what they're being given, they don't understand why it's important, then just use drops off. And then you don't actually have the uptake of the types of nutrients that are sort of embedded in that product. So I think this is a. I'm sure it's still a model that's moving and it's changing, but it's an interesting space to watch for what actually gets nutrients into people's homes and into their bodies and their kids. So I think it's very interesting. The, the, the Maggie story actually is quite lovely. First of all, we do deal from a nutri using the best nutrition maps that are available. I'm sure they can be steadily improved, but then you will know which state uh, to focus on with your products because that's where you have the greatest micronutrient. Which, which uh, state in the country? In the country, yes. So for example, in India, we, we've We've been, for example, our, our, those Maggie spice packs have grown at 87% in year on year. Mm -hmm. um, and that happens to be one of the Uttar Pradesh is one of the states where, where the fortification needs are, are the highest. But um, I think what's really fun is when you combine, again, the knowledge of, of the development community with the knowledge of a consumer goods company. Because we discovered that the ad for this Marsali Magic wasn't going to talk necessarily about the micronutrients and the health need. It really talked about what parents aspire to for their kids. So it was an aspirational mm. ad, not a please you need your iron or to, you, know, you need this or that. And, and the result was, was very positive. Um, same thing in affordable milks in North Africa. So there we work with the government. So getting the advertising, mm. the consumer promotion right such that people feel excited about consuming the product is, is as important um, in these products as in any other. Oh, well, that's an interesting point. Now, I have to turn to the young woman in the back who's been raising her hands, and then we'll go to the far back. Um. Hi, I'm Cynthia Brenning from the Millennium Challenge Corporation. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what Nestle's doing in the field of sustainable palm oil and historically what, how, how that relationship has been. Thanks. And in the far back, and then we'll come to the young man here. Hi, uh, my name is Esther Ejim. I work for an organization, a nonprofit called Niger Worldwide Charities. We are a nonprofit, and we work in the area of health education. Uh, I'm from Nigeria, and Nigeria is probably one of your biggest consumers. I mean where you have your biggest consumers yeah. because we eat everything from Maggi to baby food, you know, Similac and the rest of them. So um, what I want to know is for an organization like me that is very interested in working with the grassroots to help educate our people in the areas of healthcare, how do we team up with organizations like yours? Okay. All right, and then we'll take the guy in the um, blue blazer. I called you a young man. I'm not old enough to call you a young man. So, <laughs> Guy in the blue blazer, you'll be, you'll be the last one in this round. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Stephen Keefe. I currently work at Booz Allen Hamilton, and I'm an MBA student at George Washington University. Um, we recently did some studies on shared value models across a couple big companies, and we noticed a gap between um, having a, a strategy and the actual compensation models linking employees' behavior to those outcomes. Um, when you talked about how far shared value went down, you said it stopped at the business management strategy side and it didn't really go further. Do you feel that that's a gap in a shared value company and that's something that's needed um, when trying to go from concept to implementation of a shared value company? Okay. All right. So let's turn it over to you. Okay. Um, I think I'll take the reverse order. Um, it's a very interesting question, the compensation model and, and whether you get into your performance evaluation. I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I know that we're thinking about it. I know that we'd have to ask the head of human resources for a more appropriate answer than what, than what I have. Clearly, uh, what gets measured gets done. 
and and we all know that. And I think there probably will we will move in that way, but I do not know today where we are in our thinking. I know we don't have. I, I do know that creating shared value is ex an explicit part of our market business strategy, and that you will you will put in some key performance indicators. But at this point, we haven't, to the best of my knowledge, gotten it down to every employee's performance evaluation. So I I think that's something that will change over time. Um, and you're quite right. Uh, how to team up? I think the best thing to do is um, I suggest that we exchange cards at the end of this uh, meeting, and I'll see if I can connect you with someone uh, in our team in Nigeria. That's the best way is to introduce people. Um, lovely question on sustainable palm oil. I think um, for those of you who don't know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it was April of 2010 when the gorillas came down from the roof at our annual general meeting. So if you had been there, and I hadn't joined Nestle yet, but I don't think anyone has forgotten, when Greenpeace dressed in uh, gorilla suits and literally drew, drilled a hole in the roof of a very big building and scaled down in. Fortunately, our chief executive looked at them very calmly and said, you know, you could have come in the front door. <laughs> so in fact, they could have come in the front door. The result of, of that experience actually turns, goes from from the worst to the very best, because subsequent to the arrival of the orangutans, I apologize, orangutans at, um, through, the, through, through the ceiling, we then sat down at the table with Greenpeace. We then developed a, a relationship with the Forest Trust, and we have very explicit responsible sourcing guidelines, particularly with regards to palm oil, and they are vetted and reviewed by, uh, by these stakeholders. So I think we're in a very comfortable position, one that we're proud of. Um, and we do hope that next time it won't take orangutans coming through the ceiling. Do you ever think this sure is a bother to run a company? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder. Um, well, let me see. Well, I think we will close up after the next round of questions. Uh, let's take a few more, and then we'll uh, give you a chance to sort of meet some of, I think, some of Janet's colleagues are here also who may answer specific questions. Why don't we start with you uh, in the middle here? Hi, my name is Holly Jordan. I'm with Catholic Relief Services, which is a large relief and development agency all over the world. And um, this question is speaking to a lot of the issues that we've already discussed in the um, in the session today. But I hear a lot of questions about metrics and uh, measuring it on the Nestle side. But I also we're we're looking at exciting partnerships um, right now in livelihood diversification with coffee farmers and uh, cocoa farmers and. Um, but we, we struggle as well to really present the business case for the value of our programming to our potential corporate partners. And we're one of the reasons I'm here, we want to, we're really trying to learn how to immerse ourselves in uh, corporate culture, corporate language, because it's just not something that NGOs do very well. <laughs> and we, we want to learn more from you. What do you look for in innovative partnerships with your NGOs? Right in the front, the green jacket, more spring here. Hi, I'm Susan Davis with Improve International. And um, I'm very interested in improving and metrics and data. And you've talked a lot about success stories and your measurements. I'm curious if through your measurements or your data, have you found any failures or um, opportunities, challenges, if you will? OK, one last question I saw. OK, hand up right in the back, blue shirt. Hi, Charles Kovach, US EPA. I'd like to follow on the metrics theme for this round. <laughs> Looking at um, water metrics, I'd like to hear how you're defining your I guess, current level success when your metrics, from what I understood that you said, aren't as clearly developed yet, and then finding out what you're using to determine you know, where is that success happening. And then looking forward, maybe five, 10 years, where does Nestle want to be? And how are you going, what are some of the challenges do you see with, with getting to that point? Good, great, great place to close. Okay, um, I, I love the question uh, that you asked me about how does Nestle look uh, at NGOs and other groups for innovative partnerships? In fact, the very fact that you asked that question was a very good sign because creating shared value creates opportunities on both sides. It's, it's not just an opportunity for the business interest, it's an al also an opportunity for partners. I think um, the more NGOs and other 
potential partners look at the core business of the company that they're interested in working with, then you can create a better, more profound partnership. Um, I, I do think it's more difficult in today's world, and, and I wouldn't answer this except for that I used to run an NGO for about 10 years, so I do know what it's like to f go out uh, to try and, and fund programs on the NGO side of the equation. Perhaps in the old days, you could just go and say, well, my cause is really important, so therefore you, dear corporate donor, you should give to me. I think the world has moved on, and you have to say, my cause is really important, dear corporate donor, and this is why it's important to your business, and this is why what I know how to do matches what you know how to do, and we could be complementary. So I, I think the degree to which you understand the business that you're, the business people that you're talking to, and how you you, you can add value to that business and to the social outcomes, um, the better better the future partnership will be. Um, how do you learn from your failures? Uh, uh, I think I think. Um, this is more, more of a, oh, I mean, one of the failures was the failure to invite Greenpeace earlier than they put on their orangutan suits. Um, so I think that we've actually learned a lot from the orangutans, and I think what we have learned is that you have to sit down with your stakeholders, and you have to sit down around the table, even with those who love you and those who don't love you, and particularly the latter. And that is one of the best ways. You may never create shared value, but at least you'll have some form of common understanding. So um, I'll call it an opportunity to, uh, sorry, this is the, you were the question that, that asked about failures. The, the opportunity is to engage with critical and, and less critical stakeholders to find out what people's concerns are, to see if in any way your business is addressing some of those social concerns. So an opportunity is to systematically sit down with stakeholders and listen. So that's an opportunity. Um, in terms of water metrics, I think the interesting next stage of the water issue, and this goes beyond just Nestle, the next stage of the water issue will be not only to measure what, what's happening in our direct operations, but what's happening in the agricultural community around our direct uh, operations, and then what's happening in terms of the entire uh, area, particularly if it's a water-stressed area. So today, we master the art of measuring our own direct operations. In the future, there has to be, it has to go ever, ever broader. Uh, that may take, again, the water resources group uh, to look at the overall picture of a water-stressed area. It's not something that our company can do alone. Well, that's a great set of questions. Um, and I think it's clear that this group is very, very interested in metrics. And they're interested mm -hmm. in how you've managed to put metrics in place to see how some of this works. And will clearly be interested in how you're taking those metrics on to the next rings. Um, I want to thank you for spending your time with us. It's been very interesting. And thanks for all of you for joining us. Let's uh, thank Janet and welcome you. <laughs>